an unlawful look at an extraordinary theory of everything? Part D. Play of the principles of creation in the Nativita, Nativity scene and unknown painting by Leonardo. I never heard about Leonardo's Nativita. Where can one find that painting? The painting of La Natività, Nativity scene, can be found in the church of Santa Maria dei Canali at Tortona, a town located 42 miles south of Milan. Here is a copy. The work is attributed to an alleged Leonardesque school. However, Giorgio Vasari stressed that Ludovico il Moro had promised the Natività to Masirnia I when that emperor married, in 1494, Bianca Maria Sforza, the niece of the Duke of Milan. The Nativita was never delivered to Maximilian. Eventually, the Marquis of Tortona, brother to Bianca Maria Sforza, kept it in the church of Santa Maria dei Canali in his town. There were at least three reasons for his betrayal. Ludovico gave the Sacred Roman Emperor too much gold. Maximilian spent Bianca's exceptional dowry in a few months before abandoning her in Austria, and El Moro was defeated in 1500 when the Swiss mercenaries of Ludovico refused to fight the Swiss mercenaries of the French. Ludovico El Moro died as a prisoner to the King of France, Louis XII. Besides the testimony of Giorgio Vasari in 1568, there are three additional reasons to suspect that the Nativita kept in the church of Santa Maria dei Canali was truly painted by Leonardo da Vinci. The upper body of the two angels that bless the sea is inside the stable, but the legs of the angels penetrate the cloud located outside the stable. That trick evokes the principle of ubiquity by which an object can be found in separate places simultaneously. The fact that the legs of the angels are immersed in a cloud suggests the reality of the principle of coincidence by which separate objects can share the same space at the same time. Finally, notice that the principle of coincidence and ubiquity are united in the same view. Without the cloud, the miracle of coincidence vanishes, and without the angels, the miracle of ubiquity goes away. By contrast, classical computing responds to principles that seem to disqualify quantum computing. The principle of locality at the left establishes that an object cannot exist in separate places simultaneously. That fact prevents me from existing in separate places at once, thus denying the reality of quantum entanglement stress at the right. Similarly, the principle of impenetrability emphasizes at the left that separate objects cannot share the same space at the same time. Impenetrability which is akin to Pali's exclusion principle in quantum physics, prevents my entry into this room by going through a brick wall. As it seems, classical reality at the left denies the reality of quantum superposition, given at the right. In my view, Leonardo found that the principles of classical computing and the principles of quantum computing empower each other. In the nativity, Joseph symbolizes classical computing in the first attention, Mary, quantum computing in the second attention, and Jesus, the third attention. The relationship among the three forms of attention of nature and the mind animates the Logos heuristic and the theory of everything that present in greater detail the three labyrinths of dust return to Quetzalcoatl. The Logos heuristic, for example, leads to positing that the lost mural, Battaglia di Aguiari by Leonardo da Vinci, lies hidden under the painting Battaglia di Marciano by Giorgio Vasari in the hall of the 500 at Florence's Palazzo Vecchio. The open mouth of the soldier being killed on the ground of Battaglia di Marciano and the open mouth of the soldier being killed on the ground of Battaglia di Aguiari lie on the same straight line. How did the Logos heuristic rise up in your books? The mystery of progress fascinated both my Italian and my Venezuelan high school years in the late 50s. In the early 60s, when I studied during the day in the School of Petroleum Engineering at Maricabos Luz, 
La Universidad del Sulio. During my night classes, the Mexican professor of philosophy, Adolfo Garcia Diaz, guided me on the monovalent logic of unambiguous propositions. That makes the rigid logic expressed at the turn of the 6th century before the Companero by the Ionian Greek philosopher Parmenides from Elea. After Petroleos de Venezuela, or PDVSA, transferred me to Caracas in 1983, the Argentinian professor Angel Capelletti at the Simon Bolivar University absorbed my nocturnal research on the polyvalent logic of ambiguity, which is ascribed to the Greek Ionian philosopher Heraclitus from Ephesus. In 1989, Parmenides and Heraclitus resurfaced in my mind when a team from Boston's children certified both the Parmenidian love for certainty in my two-year-old autistic son and his inability to understand and deal with Heraclitian ambiguity. Between 1994 and 1997, PDSA kept me at the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research of MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as a visiting scientist. During the day, I worked in CEPR at the right on the scenarios of global energy growth until 2060. And during the night, I researched autism and the onset of language in Harvard University at the left. In 1996, psycholinguist Alfonso Caramazza and neuropsychologist Helen Tinker Flossberg from UMass helped me analyze the performance of nine high functioning autistic subjects and two geniuses in ambiguous and unambiguous tasks. However, in January 1997, during a snowstorm in Sharon, Massachusetts, my 10 year old autistic son led me spontaneously to the roots of autism and social intelligence. All that helped me receive that year from the Extension School of Harvard University the Dean's Prize for Outstanding LM Thesis in the area of Natural and Human Sciences. How did you observe the roots of social intelligence in January 1997? At the dawn of a snowy day, I asked my son if he wanted to drink orange juice or milk. He said, he wanted milk. Before giving him the milk, however, I asked him if he wanted milk or orange juice. He answered that he wanted orange juice. Curiosity led me to reversing a few times the terms of the dilemma, and my son always chose its last term. In my view, he could not, and cannot, sublimate the collision of mutually exclusive world, or worse. Back to Caracas, between 1998 and 2001, Professor José Padrón at the Universidad Nacional Experimental Simón Rodríguez, UNES, helped me to uncover the cognitive roots of spontaneous discourse in a doctorate on education and research. Since 2001, I've tried to falsify the logos heuristic. So far, I've been unsuccessful. Thus, at the end of October 2013, my wife organized a three-day interview concerning autism, climate change in progress in a refuge of the Venezuelan Andes. The Logos heuristic described in the fog that enveloped that interview is connected to 100 examples and 300 questions and answers of the three labyrinths of Dust Return in Quetzalcoatl published in English, Italian, Spanish, through Amazon Kindle. Why do the three labyrinths of that return Quetzalcoatl introduce your theory of everything through an interview? Our creative self rises when we dream of spontaneous solutions to key problems by viewing them as if they were challenging questions before our hard landing into the real world. In 2007, a letter that Senator Edward Kennedy sent me from Boston Commons 
inspired in me the dream of helping the commons of the earth. For example, the free species that are silently vanishing. How did Senator Edward Kennedy inspire you? A copy of Senator Kennedy's letter, written in 2007, two years before dying, is enclosed in the second labyrinth of Das Return Quetzalcoatl. In his letter, Edward Kennedy implies that we must face decisively the challenges created by climate change and terrorism-driven fundamentalism. If we added a renewed understanding of social intelligence to our technological and legislative capacity, we could change into progress the two challenges stressed by Ted Kennedy. For example, instead of causing an increase of 2 degrees Celsius or more in the average temperature of the atmosphere of the Earth at sea level, we could lower it by 2 degrees. About 9,000 years ago, that temperature drop recreated Lake Ptolemy in Sudan in the fossil Nubian sandstone aquifer under the eastern Sahara Desert. As Joseph did with Pharaoh about 3,700 years ago, we need to act in the years of abundance of the seven fat cows in order to bear with the years of scarcity of the seven lean cows. I end the documentary film here by reading Kennedy's letter. Dear Mr. Casella, thank you for your recent correspondence regarding global warming and fundamentalism. I share your concerns. During my tenure in the Senate, I have worked hard to enact legislation to combat pollution, preserve our environment and natural resources, and provide protection to endangered species. I feel strongly that we must work harder to decrease the amount of pollutants discharged into our oceans, harbors, rivers and lakes, and to reduce the emissions that pollute the air we breathe. The problem of global climate change is real and growing. After years of insisting that it was unclear whether global climate change was man-made or natural, even President Bush has recently begun to discuss the serious challenge of global climate change. However, the administration and Congress must pick up its words with actions. The industries responsible for much of the world's emissions are strongly opposing efforts to deal effectively with the problem. Thus, it is left to Congress to introduce legislation designed to control global warming, including laws requiring higher fuel standards and investment into sources of renewable energy. With regard to the challenge of global fundamentalism, I believe that this issue must be addressed in conjunction with our friends and allies around the world. The Bush doctrine of unilateral action has been destroyed by the ongoing tragedy in Iraq. Only by working with the other nations of the world can truly global issues such as global warming and fundamentalist driven terrorism be addressed. Thank you again for sending me your PowerPoint presentation on global warming. Educating the public about the dangers of global climate change is an enormous task that requires contributions from all citizens. Much remains to be done to ensure the preservation of our environment. These battles are never easy, but I look forward to progress toward achieving these important goals. Sincerely, Edward M. Kennedy